Thanks for taking the risk to have me on stage. Definitely. <laughs> and there's a risk. We practice this. We'll see how it goes. Uh, no, we're really glad that you're here. So let's begin. I know you've had a lot of people ask the story or ask the question. Uh, what exactly, it, what is the obstacle that you faced primarily growing up? Uh, I was born with a uh, birth defect that caused my arms to be deformed uh, when I was born. Um, before I was the age of two, I had several surgeries on my hands and arms um, and spent, you know, quite a bit of those first two years, my arm, right arm in a full cast, and uh, even a, uh, I don't remember the name of the surgery, but a pin in my right hand where they would release the tendon so it wouldn't curl as I continued to grow. Wow. Definitely. So, so tell us a little about the journey. Obviously, you don't remember this, but your parents would have re re told some of the story to you. Uh, but what was it like for them? When did they find out about this birth defect, and what was that part of the journey like for them? Well, they didn't find out um, that I was going to be born like this until, you know, I arrived in the delivery room, uh, which, you know, I'm sure must have been a, a shock. My dad described it as complete silence. Um, to the doctors, um, again, as you heard in the video, generally when there's a, you know, external, it uh, means that there's something wrong internal as well. So I think that shock on the doctor's face may have uh, been pretty evident to my parents, too. Mm -hmm. um, sure. I know for the next several days, my mom was under so much stress, she didn't eat or drink. Um, you know, she was asking herself, you know, what have I done and what could I have done differently? Mm -hmm. So I was the, the th their third child. And yeah. uh, of course, she's thinking what, what went wrong with this one. And, um, and my dad coordinated a global prayer effort uh, during that first week, too. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, catching everyone up. So they had, parents had no idea. They find out the moment you're born that something isn't right. And what was it? the initial prognosis then is, is not very good. Right. Um, they, the doctors pretty much expected that my internal organs weren't functioning properly and told my parents not to expect me to live more than a few days. Um, but because my parents didn't have health insurance at the time, um, you know, we were sent home after just 24 hours. And um, you know, I can't imagine that, you know, going home with a new baby and, knowing it, and just knowing it's going to be for a very, very short time. Right. Um, and, and so they, they give you, they do some blood work and some various things. But the result, you're not going to get those results for seven days. So there's a good chance that really, in terms of your story, your story's going to be done before we even get those results. That's right. Yeah, that was a uh, very stressful week for my parents, I can't imagine. Um, but uh, this test was to basically figure out what was going to ultimately kill me, basically. Uh, figure out what was messed up um, internally and also just see if it was a genetic deviation. And um, you know, seven days later it came back clear and, they, and the doctors basically said I had a, a perfect body. Mm -hmm. um, so it would turn out to be nothing. It wasn't any genetic or anything. Mm -hmm. Just Absolutely. something they couldn't put a finger on and the doctors just called it an anomaly. Uh, but looking back on it now, you know, I just kind of see it as God making a, a special key to unlock certain doors. So Absolutely. I wouldn't change it if I could. Mm -hmm. And that's powerful. So, so let's, we're going to follow your parents' track for a little bit here because uh, obviously now they have, you have two older brothers, you're the third the son that's born, and, and they're told early on you're going to have to treat him a little bit differently because of the stuff that he has going on. Mm -hmm. What was your parents' response to that? Uh, well, basically the doctors told my, my parents, you know, uh, don't cover up his feet, don't put socks and shoes on him because he's going to have to use his feet like his hands. And, uh, you know, my parents decided very early on that, based off of their concerns or the doctor's concerns, they weren't going to, you know, put a, a man-made limit on me, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, they were going to, they you know, devoted me to Christ very early on and said, God, whatever you have planned for him, you know, we trust that uh, you're going to do that through him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, they didn't treat me any differently than my brothers. My brothers didn't, uh, treat me any different either. Yeah, <laughs> we're about to get to that part of the story. <laughs> uh, so let's go down that road then. Cause, so your parents are like, we're going to treat him just like the other brothers, and, and nothing's going to change. We're not going to treat him more delicately. And, and, and you grew up with siblings. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was it like, that adjustment period? How, how, did, how did they treat you? What were some things that you guys did? Uh, well, we grew up in Venice, Florida, which is on the Gulf Coast, about an hour and a half south of here. And uh, we were just the right distance from the beach. And uh, and you know, we still had some property that we could play on. So we grew up on the water, boating, fishing, swimming, um, hunting. And uh, my dad had a heavy equipment business, so I had access to bigger equipment than I should have been driving. 
Um, <laughs> so we would build dirt bike jumps and go-kart racetracks. Yeah. So it was a good time growing up. And um, again, my brothers didn't take it easy on me. They, uh, they made sure that I grew up tough. And they used me, even from an infant, as the, the dirt in the back of the Tonka truck. To push <laughs> so. so it's because your brothers, you're like you are today, huh? That's right, yeah. <laughs> they you know? made you the strong character that you are. Um, okay, so, so that's some, some little, little bit of your family's perspective, what they were going through, and how they treated you the same as everybody else. But what was it like for you growing up? When, when did you first become aware of, maybe I'm not like all my other friends? What was that like? I don't think I really had this one specific moment of revelation where, you know, I'm so different from everybody else. Um, you know, I always thought that, you know, looking out here, I'd see lots of different people. Nobody looks exactly the same. So I think that, you know, some people are, you know, short, some are tall, some are blonde or brunette, some have ten fingers, and some have less. So, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm delusional in that way but, <laughs> or in denial, but um, I just kind of feel like God doesn't make any mistakes. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in this way for a reason, he's got a plan for it. Mm -hmm. um, one specific time I do remember was talking with one of my childhood friends. And this is very nonchalantly bringing up, you know, wondering how long it was going to take for my arms to finish growing. You know, I just figured that I was a late bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> if you drink your milk enough, That's right. yep. eventually they're just going to come out. Yeah. It's going it's to yep. all be good. Um, okay, so, so in that period of, of kind of growing up and figuring out how life was, um, what were some things that maybe or then or, or even now that, that, you were, that you were doing that society or even the doctor said there's no way he's going to be able to do that? But you said, I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to keep trying those things. I think most things that I did were viewed by society and other people that way. Mm -hmm. I think because, you know, my family and um, my close friends didn't treat me differently or, um, you know, kind of cater to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I just said, hey, he's going to figure it out. Uh, that's kind of what I would do. So I don't, yeah. I don't think that. Um, but, yeah, I think that it's just simple tasks such as tying a shoe. I think everybody's like, you, know, you probably can't do that. I, I think probably one of the most popular questions I get is, you know, uh, can you drive? It's, of course, I've been driving and uh, sitting on my father's lap. You know, I was <laughs> really young, so I, I think it's funny the, the things that people ask, but it's, yeah. it's more things than I even realize, mm -hmm. things that people don't think that I can do. Absolutely. Uh, I had a chance to, for a while, beginning of this year, I was actually working out at the same gym that, that Ben and Allison were working out at, and up until the last month or so, we did, we did some of that. And, and it was amazing to see him working out and doing all the stuff everybody else was doing and not holding back. And, of course, Allison at that point is about eight months pregnant, and one's on one side and one's on the other, and they're killing me. Like, I'm embarrassed here. I'm like, <laughs> so never holding back and always, you know, just saying I'm going to figure out a way to, to have it done was, was really a powerful part of your story. Uh, obviously, you mentioned in the video that... Uh, when you get into high school, you decide to focus on football. Uh, you'd played a variety of sports, but, but football became your passion. You said, I'm going to focus on that. I had a chance to play a little bit of football growing up. And I know a football locker room can be kind of a tough place to, to go into. Uh, until you become part of the culture, it's hard to get accepted. What was that journey like, especially because of your story? Well, I definitely think the, the Lord paved a, a nice path for me, having my two older brothers. You know, they, those ones that kind of inspired me to chase football. Uh, but also, you know, they've always been kind of uh, bigger than average and larger than life for me. And, um, you know, most of the people knew that I had some pretty big security guards that if they messed with me, that <laughs> they'd be right there pretty quick. But that's not to say that, um, you know, I had some uh, disputes with some teammates and they would let me know what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just me sticking up for myself. You know, there are more than a couple, you know, close fights or disputes, mm -hmm. for sure. Definitely. And what about even from opponents you play? Because I'm sure that they even know your story less, and so that could be a, a cause for them to kind of try to get under your skin. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's just kind of sports in general. Though. I think mm -hmm. everybody, uh, all the opponents are always going to try to pick out what appears to be the weakest area and exploit that. But, yeah. uh, you know, I would hear some comments, but you just let it roll off your back like all the other ones. Mm -hmm. I think that's a powerful reminder. For any of us, whenever we face obstacles, sometimes we think we're alone, nobody else has it like we have it, and yet been saying, listen, any opponent's going to try to pick on a weakness of, of, of the other team. And so when we gain that perspective, I think that's really powerful. So, so share with me, because I was doing some research as we were preparing for this, and I found out that the statistic is that I think it's less than 6% of high school athletes uh, that play high school football go on to play college ball. And, and yet you going on, not to play college ball, but to play for a Division I program. So at what point did you become convinced that that's what you wanted to do, was play college football? Uh, normally when I set my goals on, or my eyes on a goal, I tend to 
exaggerate it and shoot for the highest possible form of that activity. Uh, so I think once I started kicking a football, I wanted to go professional in it. So yeah. of course, college <laughs> was just a stepping stone to that. Um, so just, to, just from the start, you know, mm -hmm. I'd always wanted to be as, as good as possible. Sure. So talk a little bit, because you end up going to Liberty, which if you're not familiar, Liberty University is a Christian university in Lynchburg, Virginia. Really big school, great school. And so it's not so much they recruited you, but they were aware. You, you let them know about yourself and everything. Mm -hmm. So what was that journey like of getting into Liberty, and, and how did all that transpire? Well, I had, um, I've been in contact with several different schools and um, definitely had the desire to play you know, football in college. And um, I went up and visited Liberty a couple different times and just fell in love with the, the, the school and just the, uh, the people uh, there on the campus. And the coaching staff was great, and they alluded to the fact that you know, there may be an opportunity to continue my football career there. You know, I have to go try out and, and make the team, um, which is, of course, is a bit of a daunting task. But mm -hmm. when I got up to Liberty, uh, the tryouts were the second week of school. So I was just a typical student um, up to that, those first couple weeks and showed up for the tryouts. And there was about 80, 85 people there that showed up for it. And uh, most of these people, you know, had the physique of most, you know, Division One college football players. So, you know, I felt a little bit out of place being a scrawny 136 pound, um, you know, <laughs> brand new uh, fresh meat there. Yeah. Uh, so it was a little bit, uh, you know, I felt, you know, pretty typical because I was the unlikely one to be there. So mm -hmm. Definitely. that wasn't a new place for me. Uh, but I felt like I put, I put my best foot forward there in the in the tryouts. And that was an intended pun. Uh, so I kicked well and ended up being one of four or five players that made the uh, made the cut in that tryout. So again, beating odds, you know, out of a group of 80 people to say I'm one of the four or five who they accept to be part of the team. And that's your your freshman year, which they redshirt you. Mm -hmm. And then your, your academic, your sophomore year, but what is your redshirt freshman year when it comes to football? You're just kind of there enjoying, man, I'm part of Liberty University football. I'm watching some great games. I have a great vantage point. And then the second game of the season, what happens? Uh, well, basically, our uh, starter uh, had his leg broken by a, a defender coming around the side of the line. And it's you know, not very typical that you know, a kicker goes down with such a serious injury. Uh, but of course, my old redshirt freshman year, I'd been with the practice squad and getting reps with the team, um, but didn't expect to kick for another probably year or two. And, uh, but coach called me up, and I remember to this day the most frantic part about the whole situation was trying to find my helmet that I had stowed away in the pregame. <laughs> and uh, you know, I threw that on. I think I still had part of my chin strap covering up one of my eyes. But, <laughs> so I threw my depth perception off a little bit. But, but you made the it. kick. That's right. Made you it. made the kick. Yeah. That's all that matters. And, and you know, sometimes I think we don't think about that, but even the menial tasks like putting on your chin strap, for you would have been a huge challenge. So you're out there frantically trying to figure it out, and that's, <laughs> that's going right. to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So how, I know that was, you've shared that before, one of the ways you overcame some of those challenges was. Yes, yeah, that would be, um, you know, I just had some, some awesome teammates, um, guys nearby with lockers, or, uh, you know, oftentimes I just find a player that I wasn't too close with to build some camaraderie, say, hey, you yeah. know, buckle my chin strap or do this. So yeah. uh, teammates were always more than helpful in that way. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's good to have those people that we're surrounded by, regardless of what the football field or life. Absolutely. Um, talk real quick about, okay, so you, so you make the first field goal, and then you're called on now, what is your, for football, your freshman year, to do a, the majority of the kicking. Right. Yeah, I started about, um, that was the second game. I started most of the, uh, the following games for that season and mm -hmm. ended up doing well and score many points and uh, ended up being, you know, kind of everybody's dream to kind of get, you know, that first string position, kind of more in the limelight. I was able to do uh, some, uh, lots of articles and public speaking. Sure. Um, and I just felt like, I remember being quoted in an article up there that, you know, the more I, more exposure I got, the more the Lord could work through me, uh, which was kind of humbling because after that first uh, year that I played a lot, I had a knee injury in the off season and I missed all of spring practice, which kind of set me back. And, um, and ended up uh, another kicker slid in place and ended up being a two-time All-American. Mm. It was awesome. I still got some, some reps in with him, and it was uh, real neat being able to share the field with, uh, with a great player. Um, but that being said, I, was, I noticed that I was just as strong a witness, if not more, um, kind of out of that line, like kind of mm. the Lord shining through our weaknesses. Sure. That's awesome. Um, so on top of football being a passion, you also mentioned in the video that flying became a passion. 
Uh, so first of all, some people probably are aware, but what is it you do for a living now? I'm a uh, flight instructor at Jack Brown's seaplane base uh, here at the Winter Haven Airport. And basically we train pilots and other people just want to go see the area too. Uh, but we train pilots how to take off, land on water, uh, dock the seaplane, and uh, anything to do with flying and landing on the water. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a rough job being on the lakes all the time. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's like working, killing themselves. Like, man, I That's wish right. I could be that guy. And now they know who it is. <laughs> yeah. So if you see those yellow planes flying overhead, there's a good chance it might be uh, Ben Ships out there yeah. enjoying If you them. have a complaint, it's not me. Though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the other guy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so yeah, obviously part of your story, you said the FAA said there's a very little chance that they're going to approve you. Right. Uh, but that process didn't take very long. Right. Um, I would say back in, in 2007 is when I started taking flying lessons, and um, from the first flight I was just totally hooked. And um, you know, before you can fly solo, uh, you do have to have what's called like a, a student pilot certificate, mm -hmm. uh, which allows you to fly the plane uh, by yourself. And that was about a seven month process, and my dad's philosophy was the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So. Every phone operator in the FAA knew me by first name because uh, I would call every other day and uh, just saw how the paperwork was going. Yeah. Um, so that was uh, it definitely perseverance paid off there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So not only you become a pilot, but now you're training pilots on how to fly these particular planes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, ha I would have to imagine that you get some great responses and there are some incredible stories the first time people meet you and find out that you're going to be their instructor. That's right. That's definitely a guilty pleasure I have is seeing people's <laughs> reactions to things. Um, I remember one instance, uh, well, actually, I've done this several times. Um, <laughs> the airplanes that we fly, they're kind of vintage airplanes, but, we, of course, we've rebuilt them and modified them with, with more horsepower and things. Uh, but one thing we've kept pretty well stock is that there's no electrical system on the airplane, so there's no starter. So most of our airplanes we have to throw the propeller through manually, uh, which there's obvious risks there with that. Man, uh, I've had <laughs> Everybody knows where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> I've had more than a few students ask me, hey, does, doesn't that scare you, you know, being that close to that prop as you're throwing it through? And I say, you know, after the first two uh, accidents there, <laughs> you know, I've learned my lesson, so I've got the form down now. And, and, and one of the things I've loved from day one of, of meeting Ben was, was just his humor he has in all of this, be able to, to use those stories to make people laugh, and, and that's been so, so cool. Uh, so, so here's the thing. Like, we see your story, and now you're living your dream. You're a pilot, and you're doing uh, just, just such a, a great work. And, and you've, you've, in the past, you've played college football, and, and you've not held back. You, you hunt. You fish. You do all the stuff that you want to do. Uh, at times at church, you've even been lead people in worship, singing up on a stage, incredible voice. Uh, some of the band members had seen the video early on and noticed you're even holding some drumsticks in the video. So they're after you right now. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but they noticed that. Is there anything, uh, it seems like you're so well-rounded, is there anything that you can't do? There are a few things. You know, um, you know usually I, if I can't find the normal way to do things, I'll try 15 other ways to get around it, even using strange objects to you know, make it work. But, um, you know, a couple things might be buttoning some buttons. You know, mm -hmm. I got married, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> um, also, giving a high five, I can only go as high as a three. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, changing diapers. Yeah. And, uh, just, that's, that one's for my yeah. wife. <laughs> All I know in the hospital, you're the best swaddler, but then it comes changing the diapers, you can't do it. I'm not I'm skeptical. <laughs> I'm skeptical. Uh, yeah, speaking of which, let's go ahead and, and let everybody meet your family. Because you've been on a whirlwind the last couple of years. You got married recently, and then now a new addition. So we got a picture right. of your family right here. Yep, that's my wife, Allison, and our, our little son, Rhett. And he's uh, four weeks today. Yeah. So and she's sitting right up Go there. ahead. Everybody wanted to clap for them. I know. Go ahead. And Rhett was born with that full head of hair right there. Like, I promise you that, <laughs> man, just incredible. So, so how is that, being a father, uh, even giving you more perspective on your story? Um, yeah, I mean, I know, like, being sent home after four days and the doctor telling us that, you know, he couldn't be more healthy. Um, and then reflecting back on, like, you know, how would my parents have felt um, being told that he's not going to live long. Yeah. And I can't imagine, you know, the, the stress levels that would be. Because it's already, I'm, still now I'm jumping out of the bed if you hear anything. So, yeah. um, you know, it, that's gained even more respect for their 
uh, fortitude and their foundation in Christ through that. Absolutely. Uh, two final questions. I really want you to sink your teeth into these questions because um, just as we think about all that you've been through, um, you know, the, the, your whole journey, every part of it, uh, it's required a great amount of strength physically, emotionally, spiritually. So in, in your life, to what do you attribute that strength to? I think what best sums it up is Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Um, you know, I found that if the Lord lays a task on your heart or gives you a calling, um, you know, he's not going to leave you out to dry. He's going to supply the things that we do need, mm-hmm. of course, as long as we're walking close to him and we're in tune with his will for our life. Um, I think very specifically the people that we surround ourselves with, and uh, especially families, you know, it's not a totally random thing put together. Um, you know, I know that I would not be anywhere successful if I didn't have the family unit that I had around me growing up and even now. Mm-hmm. So I thank God daily for, for them. Mm-hmm. That's powerful. I think that so many times when we ask whatever obstacles we are that we face, uh, number one, if we know the hope we have in Christ and he gives us strength, and number two, the people we surround ourselves with, uh, no matter what obstacle it is anybody faces, those are two things that we need. Um, <clears throat> along with that, not only the strength and character that you have, uh, but also, I've been impressed from day one of meeting you with your disposition. Uh, I, I kid you not. If you're having a bad day, all you have to do is come up and talk to Ben Ships, and he'll make your day better. Like, he just always seems to have this great disposition. Uh, I know you said it wasn't always that way, that part of it was being developed. But how did you develop, and how do you maintain uh, that type of positive perspective on life? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely not something that comes naturally to anybody. Um, you know, I think our human nature is to kind of dwell on ourselves. Um, you know, there's only one thing that we can control, really. It's our attitude. So we wake up in the morning, we can decide how we're going to react to things um, and really give it to, to God. Yeah. You know, when we submit our lives to God's greater plan, um, you know, there's nothing that we can't do. Mm-hmm. Um, I was actually at the gym this past Friday and saw this sign on the wall that I've seen so many other times, but this time it really sank in, I think, maybe because I was just thinking about uh, this weekend and, and the service. Um, it says, obstacles are what you see when you take your eyes off the goal. Um, and God kind of helped correlate that to me f- with, uh, with the story of Peter and Jesus calling Peter out of the boat to, to walk on the water. And, um, you know, when Peter was had his eyes on Jesus, he was able to do the impossible. Uh, things that seemed tremendous obstacles were were a non-event. Um, so I think when we put our trust, everything that we are in him, he's not someone that's going to let us down. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And I appreciate that. If you guys would, again, thank Ben for joining us this morning.